today we're going to be spending most of the time in IntelliJ. I'm going to run through a few examples. I'm going to just do live coding. I have a few questions set up in these slides, and I'm going to solve those questions. Uh, a few logistical things first. The data that we generated yesterday in lab that you all generated, I uh, converted that to a CSV file, and I did push it to the homework repo. So if you pull the repo, you'll get that extra file. You'll get song ratings 2021.csv. You can play around with the data we generated today. Um, I have to say, don't, I mean, don't get too excited. I, I'm always excited. I like doing this kind of assignment because I, you know, last time was 2017. I haven't done it in a while. I really like doing it because I get to find, you know, fun, you know, new songs that I wouldn't have listened to otherwise. This semester, I don't know. <laughs> Not to not to judge any anything, but it, it's it's like at least fifty percent meme songs, and I mean y'all did what you y'all set out to accomplish, but well, it just doesn't make for the most interesting playlist. Let's say let's put it that way. Uh, so. Uh, so you can play around with that data. You can get the top 10 lists and, and the best playlists based on the genetic algorithm. The Based on the genetic algorithm with the uh, with the variance in energy levels, it actually does generate a better playlist with... Uh, it tends to get rid of a lot of the meme songs. I think, I think uh, all the meme songs are pretty much rated 5 for energy. So if you get the diversity in energy rating, it actually gives you a better mix of actual music that people might actually want to listen to. Not that the meme songs aren't great, but, I mean, we've all heard them a thousand times. It, nobody's like, oh my goodness, what's this Rick Ashley song? I've never heard of this before. Like, nobody's saying that. It, we're not discovering new music. Funny, sure. <laughs> Alright, so let's uh, let's get into today's lecture. Uh, today's lecture task... Oops, I don't have my note, but this is lecture task 5. Uh you already have everything you need to be able to solve this question and lecture task six. Uh, but just so we're introducing one per lecture, I'll introduce uh, this today. And then on Monday, I'll introduce lecture task six, even though it won't have anything to do with the lecture content for Monday. Uh, so I'll, I'll still introduce them one at a time. But uh, but you already have everything you need for all the lecture tasks. So for this lecture task, you're going to write a cost function for the song. Uh, we, we want a way to be able to determine how good or bad a song is according to some specific equation. So most of this is defining what that equation is going to be. And we're going to assign a cost for a function where a lower cost means that's a better song that we might want to listen to, that we might want to add into our playlist. This is going to feed into the genetic algorithm. The genetic algorithm is going to use this cost function and LT6 is writing a cost function for uh, for the playlist class to generate the playlist. This cost function is going to find just single songs to play. Uh, this cost function is going to be the return value of a method. So in the song object, you're going to write a method named cost function that's going to return a function that takes a song and returns, excuse me, and returns a double. So you want to return a function that takes a song as a parameter and returns a double. That's what you want to return. What this takes as its value is a map of strings to ints, representing the ratings for a specific user. And we're going to find the best song according to that particular user. Uh, this is going to map YouTube IDs to integers, the integer ratings. And then for each song, we're going to say if this user rated that song a 1 or a 2 based on the, this map, the input map, the function that you're going to return, it's going to return a 1,000, which is a ridiculously high score. It says, I do not want to listen to the song ever. So if you don't like all the meme songs in there, you can give this a map where all the meme songs have ratings of 1 or 2, and then they won't show up in any of your playlists. If the user has not rated the song at all, so if this map does not return, uh, does not contain a key with the YouTube ID for a particular song, consider that a rating of three. That'll be the default rating. And if the rating is three, four, or five, we're going to compute the rating, uh, the cost based on this equation: one over the Bayesian rating times the user rating. So if the user gave the song a five, you take the Bayesian rating with two extra ratings of three times five 
and then one over that to get the cost. And I give you a test case just to make sure we're all speaking the same language, that we're all computing this the same way. So write a function, or write a method that's going to return a function that implements this, uh, all this functionality. I, it, this came up in office hours. I, I told somebody in office hours, so I'll tell the whole class now. You don't need recursion for this. Uh, in, in fact, I don't, it's not even one of those things where, like, I don't even know if it's natural to use recursion for this. Uh, like, I didn't even think about it writing my solution. Um, there's just, just not really a need for recursion here. Uh, same with LT6, actually. Uh, unfortunately, LT4 is the only one where I really got a good recursion question. I meant to have two, but since LT3 is so broken, I, I'm not really hitting you with recursion like I want to. Until you do AO1, AO1 is going to be a ton of recursion. And AO2 is, again, no recursion. So keep that in mind if that helps you. If you're trying to figure out where I'm asking you to use recursion here, you're going to be looking a while. All right, any questions on the lecture question? And I actually want to do, so I have two examples that I want to go through, and we're right back to the lecture task. I'm going to go into IntelliJ and do these. I'm actually going to start with the second slide, because I like to do, I, I like this one better. Yeah, AO2, I mean, you, you might be able to use recursion there, uh, but it's not naturally, there's no natural place where recursion is needed. There might be a place, depending on how you set things up, where you want to use recursion. Um, but for LT5, 6, and AO2, any place where you would want to use recursion can be replaced by one of the data structure methods pretty easily, the ones that we saw last Wednesday. You can use some combination of those approaches to replace where you would end up using recursion. You can use recursion instead of those. That's perfectly fine. But call one of those methods and have that method replace your recursion is another approach. Either way you want to do it. So no more questions on that. Let's get moving with this. So uh, I'm like I said, I I don't have uh, any starter code for this. I'm gonna start this from scratch and just show you the whole process of going through this. I think I'm gonna ignore the package names here so I can get the code all in one place. Um, but I, maybe I'll kind of follow that. Um, but let's write this. So what I want to do is using our, our setup of var being banned, write a, a method, and just so I'm 100% upfront with this, this is uh, um, showing you how to work with data structures in recursion, which you're asked to do in LT4. So if you're struggling with LT4, this is the one, that's so why I want to lead with this one. Pay attention to this, uh, this example, and watch how I use data structures here. So what we want to do is write a method named histogram, that takes a list of integers and returns a map of integers to integers, which is a histogram of the inputs. This is what I, I literally was just typing this over on my laptop, those of you who were there before lecture. So if this is worded weird or has typos, uh, I'll, I'll explain them right now. So it takes a list of ints and returns a map of int to int, mapping each unique int from the list. So each time we find an int in the list, we're going to increment that uh, that value in the map and map that to how many times it appears in the input list. And I'm going to start with the test cases. I'm going to use test driven development. So we know, uh, so we're all on the same page of what's being asked here. I procrastinate. I was actually processing those songs and then I completely forgot that I wanted to do slides. Like I knew I wanted to do this example, but I completely forgot I wanted to do it in a slide. So I procrastinate or uh, just completely forgot. Either way, I wasn't prepared. Um, but I'm prepared to write this code. So let's hop over to IntelliJ and do exactly that. So let's, I'm going to go in, I'm going to go in archived. I'll probably, uh, I should be pushing this after lecture. So if you're looking for it after lecture, archived live coding. And if chat, if I forget to, uh, if I forget to do that, make sure you remind me, make sure you be like, yo, Jesse, push that stuff. Uh, I'll create a package functions here where we'll have everything for today. Is that what I want to do? Let me do FP. Let 
Let me just do it this way. Uh, I'll just do FP. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to get hung up on the name. I'm gonna steal a, a test suite right here. Test histogram. Histogram. And then another class. It'll actually be an object for I don't know functions. And I want to write a method named histogram that takes a list of int, I don't know, input data, list of int, and returns a map of int to int. And when we're using test-driven development, this is typically what we, we'll do, is we'll, I don't need to use null here, I can use map is we'll write the method that we write the header for the method that we need and do what we call stubbing it out. So we write the header of the method, so we define the inputs and outputs, and then we'll just return any default value, just anything, just to get this to compile. If we have nothing, this is gonna be a compiler error, just something to make sure that this compiles. And then we can start writing our tests because we have a method to call. Drives me nuts. Histogram. I like that feature in theory, but it, it hurts me more than it helps. So now we can do functions dot histogram with some list and start having some input output behavior. So let's set up our test cases. Uh, test cases is going to be a map get ready for this one a map of lists of ints to a map of ints to int which equals a map if you don't set your test cases up exactly this way that's fine uh, if you don't like a map of list of ints to map of int to int, if you don't like that, you know you can you can do your test cases one at a time. I'm gonna do this do it this way so I can put them in a loop. Uh, I'm gonna steal repetitions. Test case is the first one. If I have a list of one, one, two, three, four, the output that I expect is going to be a map. That's going to be a map mapping one to one. 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1. So if this is my input list, this is going to be my histogram. 1 appears once, 2 appears once, 3 appears once, 4 appears once. Let's duplicate that. And let's do uh, something a little more, a little bit more data here. Maybe I should ask chat. I should ask y'all for test cases. Have this be like yesterday's lab. So I have three ones. I just want a test case with multiples in here. Three ones. I ended up with two twos. I only put one three. And let's do five fours. Let's add a couple more fours in here. There's a good one. Let's do empty list. Should return an empty map, which is probably going to be our base case here. Repetition wants this list. Oh, it's it's too big for did you do that is that why you did that to overflow an int it's going to be a map mapping uh two to one one to one five to one that is you did do that on purpose right you clever clever fox uh, i'm not going to overflow an int of course But we will make sure we handle big, uh, large integers. 
I mean, we could change this to long. I mean, but let's not get let's not get too crazy. Let's grab Blitzkrieg's input. There's a a big test case that we're missing here. What don't we have in any of these test cases yet? One to one, two to one, three to one, four to four, five to one. The negatrons. You are correct. You are correct, Jay. Uh, so let's grab this one again. Let's even get fours and negative fours. That's a good test case to make sure that we distinguish between the two different fours. And let's hit a negative two in here too. So negative two. Let's duplicate this. This should be a nega, negative four, three of those, and we had one regular four left. Let's make that two just to really make sure, just to really drive that point home. Make sure that we're handling those negatives. Uh, zero as well. Now let's make this test case a little more interesting. This will be a big test case. If we get this one, then we're doing good. Uh, zero to two, a list with one element we didn't do yet uh, and let's make that uh, an interesting element let's make it a big negative power of 2 negative 10 24 to 1 use the absolute function well no we'd actually want to map the negatives we want the keys to be negative we don't want to use absolute value here and let's set up our, our test cases. If somebody has a new, oh, LG has a good one. Ooh, I'm on the wrong screen. Zero to one, 10 to one, three to one, Five to one. What am I missing there? I got an extra close print. Uh, and let's set up our, our testing for input. Expected output. In our test cases, assert of input equal equal expected output. Chat, can I get away with that? I'll Print out the input, and then um, then I can know which one failed. It says five to one, not five to two. Let me do my let me do auto formatting. Oh, I don't like that auto formatting. Uh, five to one should be right here. Thanks, chat. Where's your compare doubles? Yeah, can I get away with this? There's a reason I, I used ints and maps and stuff like this. Because the testing is a lot easier. If this if this were doubles, well, that would just break everything, actually. Um, we'd have to do more. If this outputted a list, like... I can actually get away with this because... Uh, I'm using ints, so we can use equal equal with doubles. We'd have to use compare doubles. We don't have to do that because we have no doubles here. We also don't have to worry about ordering because the order of a map is meaningless. Lists have a very particular order. If the output was a list, I would have to handle the order in some way, and I would use my favorite solution, just sort both lists. Since these are maps, there is no, no meaningful ordering, so it's going to check each key. Is this key in the other map? And... Uh, 
Can we do this? Is this going to be quick enough? No, not quick enough. We're not we're not going there. But I'll check for each key in one map. Is that key in the other map? And do they map to the same values? Skyla's going to do all that for us. No worrying about uh, anything else. So we're good here. I'm happy with these test cases. We can always add more test cases, but this is hitting all of the uh, all of the usual problems. So let's head over here to our histogram and actually write this thing. So we want our four ingredients for successful recursion. And let's set that up. And we're going to run into a big problem right away, a problem that you know those of you who are on LT4 have ran into. And uh, it's going to happen very quick. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first, I like starting with the base case. What's a trivial input-output behavior here? It's actually one of our test cases, if input data dot is empty. If we have the empty list, we're going to return an empty map. Base case done, we're already done with one of our ingredients. In our else, actually, I don't know if we're, are, are we going to run into that problem? We might not. Um, actually, we're not. We're going to, we're going to assume that our recursive calls are correct. So somewhere in here, I, I'm going to call histogram on some input. And I want to make sure that input gets me closer to the base case. So if this recursive call gets us closer to the base case, this is going to be, and since my base case is the empty list, this is going to be something like input data with at least one element removed. That's what we want as our recursive call. We're going to assume that that's correct. And then we're going to build the rest of our logic based on that assumption. So this is going to give us histogram that's accurate for the input list. And then we're going to write the rest of our logic based on this. So we got to figure out two things. Our assumption, that here's our assumption right here. Our uh, for induction, this will be your inductive hypothesis. We're just going to assume that that's correct. And we want to figure out what this input is going to be and then build our logic around that to get use this input and then build the actual output that we want. So we're going to return, return some map that uses the map from the previous line. So that's the way I'm thinking. That's the way I want to approach a question like this when I when I know I'm using recursion because we would just write a loop for this and have some vars create a new map. We would say var map and then iterate over all the list and then update the map as we go. That's what we would normally do, but we can't use var. So we're going to use recursion here. Yeah, no helper. That's what I was getting at with the intro, but I, I don't think we're going to need a helper here. Um, but, uh, but that's something I want to explain sometime in this lecture. I believe the next question requires a helper. Uh, so let's figure out what we're going to call for the recursive call. Now, I don't have any idea what input data is. I don't know any structure. Like, There's no meaningful way that I can handle that. So I'm just going to do whatever for the recursive call. And I'm going to say, let's handle just one int from this list. And then call, make the recursive call on the rest of the list. Dot tail will do this for you. Or drop one will do this for you. Drop left one will do this for you. Um, apparently not drop left. Drop right. Uh, but drop will do this for you. Drop one will remove one element, uh, return a list with the first element of the list removed. So let's do drop one, which is the same as tail.
tail is just drop one, literally. So let's use drop one. And those of you, I use that a lot during my lectures and when I'm coding. Uh, that's control click I'm doing to go to the source of any definition. You can do that for your own um, your own methods as well. If I want to go to the definition of histogram, it'll take me right to it if I control click it or command click on Mac. So, so let's create, I don't know, next list. I don't know what to name this thing. Uh, this is a list of int. And it's the input list with that one element removed. I'm going to put this in a variable because I have to use it a couple of times. No, I don't. What am I? What am I thinking? Um, I'm still going to keep it as a variable or a value because I already wrote it. Uh, but I have to get that first value that we're we're getting. The first element is going to be input data dot head or input data of one and we use dot head because that's um, I think we've used that already quite a bit in the class so I'm grabbing the first element from this list I'm removing that element from the list and then I'm making my recursive call on that list so I'm going to assume that this recursive call gives me the accurate histogram for next list, the list without the first element. And now I need to take that histogram and process first element. So my goal is to take a histogram that's completely correct, except has not processed this first element. And I need to process that first element. So my recursive step, all I'm doing is processing a single element of the input list. And I'm going to do that by saying if there's two conditions here. And let me rename this variable. I don't like that. This uh, um, uh, histogram for next list with an M. So if histogram for next list dot contains first element so if that element is not in this map we want to return that map plus adding a key value pair for the first element mapping to one. This is the first time that we've seen that element. And I actually don't like that name. I'm gonna call it element to process. There are two, two C's or one C in process, one C. Uh, and I wanna add that element to the map. This element is not in the map. That means this is the first time we've seen it. So I'm going to add that element as a key value pair mapping to one. This is the first time we've seen it. Let's add it to the thing. If we've already seen it, we're going to do histogram plus a key value pair element to process mapping to whatever's in this map at that value plus one. I need some parens here. Oops. Oh my goodness. Not either of those places. So I'm going to get whatever is stored in this map for this element. That's how many times I, I've seen this in the rest of the list from my recursive call. So if I've already seen this element, take however many times it appears in the histogram already. Pop that up by one and then add that key value pair back into the map. Do we have our four ingredients? We have a base case, trivial input output. We're assuming histogram is correct. 
the call to histogram gets us closer to the base case and our logic as long as you believe me our logic is sound there you should be able to follow that one there, there's not much going on it's either in the histogram you add one or it's not in the histogram and you set it to one when are you creating the map only in the base case and this is the the trick when you're working with uh, when you're working with uh, things uh, data structures in recursion is it's very often that your recursion is only going to create a new data structure in the base case and then as you return you return this base case so this line is going to return the empty list and then you add a key value pair to it return that the next recursive call is going to get a histogram with one key value pair in it and then it's either going to add another key value pair or increment the key value pair that it's already seen and then return that. And then the next recursive call is going to add another thing. So you're actually accumulating all the data in the data structure that you're returning on your way up the recursion. You're not doing, you're not computing anything as you go down the recursion in this case, but as you come back up, that's where you're adding all your data in into this. How confident should we be on these tests, chat? very confident is the answer we're perfectly fine and we have test cases that you're all happy with so we're pretty confident that that works correctly and by the way this is how you should do testing write a whole bunch of tests write your tests think of anything that could go wrong let's do large numbers let's do negative numbers let's do multiple numbers let's do a data structure do we ever do a data structure with only one thing let's add a, a test case here um, Because this is something that could go wrong. I should have counted those as I was doing them. Jeez, oh, that drives me nuts. It's the second time I got burned this lecture. One, two, three, four, five. Ten, fifteen, twenty. Huzzah. And we're good to go. And at 25, we got time for the next example, too. So we have what we're comfortable with for testing. I didn't write test cases and submit to Autolab and say, oh, what does that test case name mean? I got to write a test for that. Multiple, let's see, multiple of the same number. Uh, breaks on lists that only contain one unique value. Okay, what could that mean? Let me write a test case for that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just thinking about what could go wrong and what kind of different inputs I can give this method and that might break it. I just came up with a whole bunch of test cases and chat came up with a whole bunch of test cases and we threw all these test cases at our method. It uh, We got our green check marks, so we're happy. We're building confidence that we do have correct code without the use of Autolab and very, very importantly, without the use of Autolab. So everyone good on that example? Let me set up the other one and I'll, I'll watch for questions. As we take a look at this guessing game, this one's a bit trickier. This number guesser, what we wanna do is, uh, I'll probably just call the method number guesser. I'll, I'll deviate from this a little bit. A number guesser, which is going to take, uh, Oh, yeah, that's how I set it up. Ooh. Two takes two doubles in a function as parameters. I don't, oh, yeah, do I even want to do this one? I'm sorry. Live coding is helpful. Nice. Because this one's going to be really live because in my mind, I thought this was set up different. Maybe I'll just do it with a different setup. But. Takes two doubles and a function double to Boolean as a parameter representing the lower bound. Oh, yeah. Okay. It is what I thought it was. I'm, I'm just confusing myself. I apologize for that. That's that's awful. Uh, so two doubles representing the lower and upper bound uh, that I can guess. And it's going to take a function that's going to give me my higher or lower. What I want to do is return some hidden number to two decimal places 
the hidden number is defined by this function. So let's set this thing up. Yeah, I, I was just confusing myself there. So let's set this up to make it clear what we mean by that. is set up. I was just confusing myself. Uh, double. So we're going to take a, a double for the minimum. A double for the maximum. And a function that takes a double and returns a boolean which we can ask for higher or lower give it some default value set up our tests i'm i'm just going to set up a couple of tests for this one let's do it let's do it like this do i have one I'll just write it. I'll just write a new one. Epsilon within it said to two decimal places, so my epsilon will be two. Uh, def compare doubles. Uh, D1 double. D2 double. Boolean. Oops, 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 oops. One character will get, get you. And uh, programming, you all know that by now, though. Compare cobbles. <laughs> come on, come on, brain, work with me. Uh, D one minus D two. That abs less than epsilon. I'll use some different syntax here just to switch things up, so it's not the the same exact thing you've seen forever. Uh, and we want to create some. I'm going to do this all in one line, actually. Assert functions. No, I can do it this way. List of we can just create a whole big list of the inputs that we want to test. Uh, let's try 0 0.0, 1.0, 50 .0. max. So we'll be thinking of a number between negative 100 and 100. These will be the numbers that we're thinking of. Negative uh, 99.9, .9, positive 99.9. .9, uh, negative 50 math dot pi let's throw a curveball in there uh, math dot e while we're at it negative 33.3333 uh, 56.342 21.0 math.random <laughs> why not uh, let, let's let's table that one for now and uh, do veil all inputs equals list of double equals inputs let's do it this way that for you yep. 
parens instead of braces there. I have yield spelled wrong. And then for input in all inputs, uh, minus 0 0.5. Let's scale this. If there's time at the end, I'll explain that, or I can explain after lecture, if that doesn't make sense. Uh, but we're getting a thousand, a thousand and one actually. Let's do a thousand. A thousand random values from negative a hundred to a hundred. So we're we're doing some good testing here. Then assert number guesser. Then we got to set up our function. Min min max and then a function that takes a double I realize I overuse that underscore shorthand sometimes you can't use that and um, and that's been it's been uh, tripping students up and I always forget I always got to think about this which way this goes so do we want true to be higher or true to be lower I'm doing this all in one line so if the guest number is lower then the input we're going to return true true so true means you have to your next guess should be higher right so this is the number we're currently guessing and this function is going to say whether we're, we need to go higher or lower so if that number's if the answer is higher that's going to be a true so if this returns true our next guess needs to be higher because that means the number we guessed is less than the hidden number. This will be the, the hidden number that we're supposed to be guessing. I'm going to use an underscore here. Uh, let's run this. and We should fail with, uh, fail horribly. Oh, we failed even more horribly than I anticipated. It's the end of that test. Oh, we have an extra brace. And we failed. So let's write this. Base case. If Oh yeah, this is where it comes in. Okay, this this is good. This is what I want to show. So what's our base case? If We're within 0 0.01 of the answer of the hidden number return. That's what we want our base case to be. And how are we going to set this up? We have min, max, and a function. Our recursive step is going to be if. So we're going to be guessing some number. Our current guess, actually I don't have to do it that way, do I? Uh, if our current guess, which we don't know what it's going to be yet, if this function of current guess, if that returns true, that means our next guess should be higher. Else, next guess should be lower. So this is logically what we want to do. And how are we going to do that? I 
I know how I would do that. So let me give... My favorite solution doesn't show what, what I want to show. I have to figure out how to do this May, uh, do this in a different way. Let me let me set this up. So what we what we really want is if the previous guess minus the current guess oh, I don't really have time to do it this way do I what I really want is this then return one of the two either current guess or previous guess this is what I want my base case to be, except I don't have access to this information. Whenever we're in a situation like this, and this is very common in recursion, is you can write a helper method. Whenever you need more parameters, create a helper method that's going to have the parameters that you want. So let's do previous guess as a double. current guess as a double and then we can preserve the rest of our inputs and then the only thing the actual method does the one that is doing it has takes the parameters that we need it to take the only thing this is doing is deferring to the helper with some initial guess let's have our previous guess be double dot positive infinity our current guess can be min plus max over 2. Then min, max, and f just get forwarded. Now we have some initial values for the extra parameters that we need. And now we have access to those parameters. And then we're going to use those parameters every time we make a recursive call. Then we check, okay, current guess, we're actually going to have to generate what's our current guess going to be. We're going to have to generate this before our base case. We have to say what our current guess is going to be. And I want that to actually be, I'm just going to start showing you my solution to this, uh, the halfway point between the min and the max. Oh, yeah, current guess doesn't need to be a parameter. We just want to remember the previous guess. It doesn't need to be a parameter. We're going to compute that right away. Uh, so we're going to compute the current guess, and if that's close to the previous guess, that's our answer. Otherwise, we're going to have to check. Is our current guess higher or lower? If it's higher, we're going to make a recursive call. If we have to guess higher, we're going to make a recursive call the previous guess is the current guess. And if we're going higher, I'm going to use one trick here that's going to give us everything that we need. Instead of forwarding min, I'm going to have min be our current guess. If our next guess should be lower I'm doing the same thing except max is going to be replaced by our current guess and this is effectively binary search for those of you those of you uh, with a keen eye where we're going to take the midway point between min and max and then we're going to replace either min or max with the current guess that's going to cut our search space in half and then search the rest of the rest of the space. When min and max are 100, our first guess actually let's print them out. Print line current guess. 
We'll do a little print line debugging here because uh, we're over time already. Print line. Um, base case. And then a few new lines so it's not interfering with the next one. So we're going to first guess zero, then depending on higher or lower, either 50 or negative 50, and then branches out from there. Let's run our tests. How confident are we this time? I gotta admit I'm a little less confident than last time, but we still passed it. So depending on our, our output, our expected output, oh, let's print that out too. I had no reason to not be fully confident. And we can see our binary search in action here. We're going to start by uh, an input of zero. We actually, so just the way my code is written, we didn't didn't get the previous guess. Like that's just not the way my code's working. Um, zero, we're going to go to negative 50, negative 25, and then slowly keep cutting this in half until we're at the accuracy, the precision that we want. 1.0, same thing, 0, 50, 25, keep cutting that in half until we get close to 1. We actually went, uh, had a guess where the answer was higher once in there. And then we can see all of our random values. We kept guessing until we got that value. So let's analyze our recursion. Let's look at the, this will be the last thing and then I'll cut the lecture. Uh, let's look at our base case. Our base case is some trivial input output behavior. If the previous guess is within 0.01 of the current guess, then we're presuming that we're within 0.01 of the actual answer because we don't have enough variance there. We're not moving, you know, we've narrowed in to within one one hundredth of the solution. Uh, if that's the case, just return the current guess. The current guess is close enough, we're gonna return it. If we're not close enough, we're going to make recursive calls that we assume are correct, and we're gonna narrow down the range that we're searching to narrow down to eliminate the half that we've figured out that isn't uh, isn't the solution. So we took the midpoint and we said, is the number higher or lower than the midpoint? If it's higher, everything below the midpoint can be removed. If, if uh, what we guessed was higher than the midpoint, so the solution is lower, then everything above our guess can be removed. And we're slowly just narrowing down on the correct solution. And the last thing I'll do, we can uh, play with the precision. Oh, but these are getting closer to the base case because we're narrowing down. Uh, we're narrowing down the precision. And we can increase our accuracy. We'll get more recursive calls, but we can get narrowed right down. Oh, that's a, not the best example, but we can narrow down to get even closer to that value.